Hey, good evening. It's Sunday evening. We're continuing in Daniel chapter 6. And chapter 6 is the last of the historical section. Daniel's first six chapters of history. The next six chapters, which is all the rest of the book, is prophetic. Uh, but chapter 6 is where we get that famous story we all learned about probably as little kids, Daniel in the lion's den. And let's see how that came to pass here in chapter 6, verse 1. A new king's taken over. Remember, the Medes and the Persians have conquered Babylon, so uh, the new kings have taken over, and Darius the Medes in charge here. So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom. Uh, he, he's going to set up his own organization now. It's actually not a bad organization. He put, he put 120 princes or leaders over the whole kingdom, kind of like Congress, I guess. And over these, then he set three who he called presidents here in the King James Version. So he's got 120 um, we'd call them like the congressman, and then he's got three guys over that, and then the king's on top. And of the three presidents, the first one, the most important one, is, is President Daniel. He made him Dan uh, president of the, of the whole nation here, shared with two other guys. Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts to them, and the king should have no damage. So it's hard to get up to the king, and everybody else took care of things, ran the business of then this, verse 3, this Daniel, he was preferred above the presidents and princes. He, everybody liked Daniel and everybody else got jealous of him. You know how that goes. And why did everybody like Daniel? Because uh, he was wise, we found out, from the many years ago when he was a boy. Old Nebuchadnezzar figured that out. But he also had an excellent spirit in him because an excellent spirit was in him. And uh, I, I hope there's an excellent spirit in you too and you know that's the that's the fruit of the holy spirit that the rest of the world sees an excellent spirit in you and um, i tell you i see a lot of folks that they they believe um, religiously and politically just exactly like i do but uh, when they post things it's like it's always angry you know we need to be careful about that we need to have a good spirit in us but excellent spirit was in in daniel and the king thought to set over him the whole realm so the the king was even going to promote him even higher so you know what happened. Here comes the green-eyed monster with the rest of the government here, verse 4. Then the presidents and the princes, they sought to find occasion against Daniel. we, we got to dig up some dirt on him, they're, they're going to say, concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion or fault because he's living a, a righteous life for as much as he was faithful. And Daniel, I think, encompassed in here that he was faithful is, of course, Daniel was faithful to God, but Daniel was also faithful to his job and faithful to what the task that he had to do. And, and you know, Christians ought to be that too. Like, we're faithful to God, but uh, we want to be good employees or whatever else we're feeling here in this life. If it's, uh, if it's worth doing, the Bible says, then do it with all you might. And whatever you do, do it as unto you're doing it to the Lord. So that was Daniel. They couldn't find any fault in him. He was doing his job well. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So, verse 5. Then said these men, We'll not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. It's sort of like the same crowd that's trying to, in the New Testament, to... Uh, the kangaroo court of Jesus. They're all putting their head together. What are we going to charge him with? And they keep coming up. They couldn't make nothing stick, right? So they had to trump up something. So except we find it against him and concerning the law. We're not going to find any fault with him except if there's some way we can get, we know he puts God over government and everybody else first. So if there's some kind of conflict between his God and, and the government, then we can get him on that because he's going to put God first as every Christian should. We can't find nothing against him concerning the law, unless it's against him concerning the law of his God. Verse 6. Then these presidents, these other two presidents, and the rest of the 120 princes, they assembled together to the king, and they said unto him, You know what, by now, O king, live forever. King Darius, live forever. It's what everybody said, and they come into the presence of the king, maybe because they wanted to live forever. You know how it was back then. But all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, the whole cabinet, the whole shebang, they've consulted together to establish a royal statute. We want a special law and to make a firm decree and that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god 
or man for 30 days except you, king, he'll be cast into the den of lions. And, of course, that kind of appealed to the king, too, because they're basically saying, for 30 days we want to show everybody that there's nobody higher than you, king, right? We have no king but Caesar, the, the enemies of Christ said. So when that ever, something like that happens and the law comes in contact in, in conflict with God's law, as the apostles said, we've got to serve God, not man. His, he's number one. And if we have a conflict, then we're, that's the time for Christians to practice civil disobedience. And say, hey, we cannot do that. Our God doesn't allow it. So that's what they've come up with. They know this is how we'll trick Daniel because we know that's how he thinks. Now, O king, verse 8, establish the decree and sign the writing, just like here in America when Congress makes a law, you know, the bill goes and it's voted on and all that, but finally the president signs it. And once the king signs it, and, and according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, it becomes law and, and nothing can change it. So that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Uh-oh, now it's law. For 30 days, nobody asked any god or any man anything other than the king. So verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. That's how the Jews prayed in that day, you know. They always, wherever part of the world they was, they faced where the temple had been in Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day. It's good to have contact with God over every meal. That's at least three times a day for most people. Then pray before you go to bed at night. That's one, two, three, four times a day that you touch base with God. It's good for you. God don't need it, but you do. <laughs> so three times a day, he kneeled upon his, on his knees, and he prayed, and he gave thanks before his God. Now here's the important time, important part of this. As he did before time. This ain't something that Daniel did new. It's not like, well, they've made me mad now. I'll just show them. I'm going to go home. I'm going to fling open my windows, and I'm going to face towards you, and I'm going to pray, and that'll get I'll, I'll just test that law. No, Daniel has been doing this all his life. And he says, I'm going to continue to pray. I believe if Daniel went to our government school and they said, hey, you can't be praying, I believe old Daniel would have kept praying, don't you? Because he, he said, I ain't changing my life with God for whatever some stupid law is down here way beneath God. And so he gave thanks to God just as he did before time, verse 11. Then these men assembled. Where do you think they assembled? It don't say, but I'm assuming they assembled right outside old Daniel's window because they knew <laughs> what time he did that every day of his life. And they were ready. If they'd had cameras back then, the paparazzi had been there waiting on the windows to pop up and take his picture, wouldn't they? These men assembled, and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So now what are they going to do? They're going to go tell on him, right? So then they came near, verse 12, and they spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Verse 13, they, then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, that Daniel, which, which is of the, the children of the captivity of Judah, he regards not thee, okay? He don't pay any attention to you, nor the decree that you have signed, but he makes his petition three times a day. He didn't break it just once. He does it three times a day. He don't care nothing about you, king. Verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased. Now, this is important. Though. Look what it says. He, he's sore displeased with who? The king's sore displeased with himself because he knows that he's been tricked into signing this law, and he don't like it. But he knows that he signed it, and he's the law, and it can't be changed. So he was sore displeased with himself, and he, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He was arguing with him and trying to find a way out of this. But verse 15, these men assembled to the king 
And they said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is, and that no decree nor statute which the king establishes may be changed. So then the king commanded. He knew he had been whooped. And they brought Daniel. And they cast Daniel into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel. Now remember, the king likes Daniel. He's just been tricked into doing this. Can't figure a way out of it. So um, the king, he, he, he says, uh, he goes to Daniel, and he says this. He says, thy God whom thou servest, he'll deliver thee. Now, I'm of the opinion that the king didn't really believe that right then, but he, 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 he liked Daniel, and he knew that Daniel believed that, so he was just trying to encourage Daniel before he threw him into the, yeah, God you serve, he'll deliver you, Daniel. <laughs> I think that's the way this is. And so they put him in the den of lions, verse 17. A stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. Remind you of Jesus' grave, don't they? Rolled a stone. With, they had the stone there to keep the lions from getting out, but they put Daniel in there and laid it where nobody could go in and out. And the king, the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, the signet rings that put in the wax seal that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. I guess that last part's talking about the law. It was signed in the law and sealed with his ring. Verse 18, then the king went to his palace. Now, look here, the, this kind of ironic, uh, it, it looks like uh, the old king, he can't sleep or eat and don't want to listen to no music or nothing. He just tore up all night. He got the worst night of his life. He's worried about his friend Daniel. He's, he's put in a den full of lions. He, 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 and, but, but on the other hand, it looks like old Daniel's passing the night peacefully over here sleeping with the lions. <laughs> So the king went to his palace, he passed the night fasting, neither were there instruments of music brought before him, and, and his sleep went from him. He couldn't sleep a wink. Then the king arose very early in the morning. It was getting daylight. He said, I got to go check on Daniel. And he went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest, continually able to deliver thee from the lions? And then he heard a voice come back out of that hole down there. O king, live forever, Daniel said. <laughs> and Daniel told him, said, my God has sent an angel. Now, this angel that God sent to be with Daniel in the lion's den... I believe that same as that fourth man in the fire that Daniel's friend several chapters ago seen in there with them, don't you? It's the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. My God sent his messenger, an angel, and he shut the lion's mouths that they've not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And I also, and also before thee, O king, I've done no hurt. So, I believe there's still power in living a righteous life before God and before men. And that's where Daniel said, his, he, said he sent his angel because innocency was found before me and he knew that I hadn't done you any wrong either, king. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. We could do a lot with that, but we won't. I'll say this one. Uh, God never promised you that you wouldn't end up in the lion's den, but he did promise you that he'd go with you through it. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world, he said. And the king commanded, verse 24, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. They brought the tattletales and the tricksters to the king, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them and their children and their wives. Judgment came on them, kind of like, kind of like Haman getting hung on his own gallows here, ain't it? And, and, their lion, and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces before they ever made it to the bottom of the hole, the bottom of the lion's den. <laughs> then King Darius wrote unto all people, he's the most powerful man in the world at this time, right? So he sends out a a law that I'm sure scribes copy, and they send it out to all the different directions to the, the nations that the Medes and the Persians are ruling at this time. And um, it, it's one of those things where these people, controlled by the devil, 
they meant it for evil, like, like Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because the, God, the, the good news of the living God, we'll say in here in the Old Testament, is sent to all the nations here because, and I think old King Darius, he, he understood who the true God was now too. So verse 25, King Darius wrote to all people, nations, languages that dwell in the earth, letter, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he's the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that shall which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even to the end. He got it right, didn't he? And he said, goes on in his letter and he says, He delivers and he rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who's delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. Darius was a, was a, they were jointly. Remember the statue before we close? We go back early to the beginning of this book. The statue in the beginning, it had a head of gold and Daniel interpreted and said, that's you, King Nebuchadnezzar, but said there's a kingdom that's coming. That'll be silver. It won't be as shiny and everything as the first kingdom that you've got, but it it had two arms. And now we see those we're seeing that silver kingdom with the two arms of the Medes and the Persians are the most powerful kingdom on earth. And it's going to go on down through history, but that's where we are now. See you next time.